What a day. Thank you very much indeed, uh, everybody, uh, who made today possible. I think it's been, from my perspective, as somebody who's been working in this area for some years, really exciting, uh, just fabulous. And uh, the style with which Bob and the writers of the papers and then others have just engaged and exchanged is brilliant. I'd like to draw on some of the words and ideas that came out of the presentations today. First of all, I'd like to focus on five different areas. I'm just looking at the body language, actually. There's a bit of tiredness in the room. <laughs> Do you remember what it was like at medical school or whatever other university you went to when you had these lectures that went on? And nowadays, we have distractions like cell phones. We can pretend we're tweeting, but we're actually <laughs> playing solitaire or something like that. Five areas. One, knowledge, evidence, framing all that stuff, the, the stuff that we've been discussing today. Secondly, power, governance, duties and commitment. What those who are in power have responsibility to do. Some of it very clearly set out in moral codes and in human rights law. Thirdly, capacity and cash, i.e. people and the money that will enable them to work and the systems that will enable them to do stuff. Four, processes and actors, ways of different, bringing different groups of people together. And five, results and accountability. In today's discussions, we have focused, in my view, in many ways on these five different areas. They're totally interlinked, but I think it's worth also particularly drawing on the words of Ferro, Andrew, Sandra, and Anna this afternoon to try to pick them apart a bit and think what has this fantastic second series helped us to think about and focus on in these different areas. If I start with the knowledge, evidence, framing bucket, I'd like to suggest that the second series really has, as Anna's already said, given us a huge amount to work on in terms of rethinking how nutrition as an issue is handled in just about every domain. And we're not just talking about shortage, we're talking about uh, overconsumption or excess or other terminology, but the Knowledge and evidence is coming strong and new, and the framing is different. And what do I personally think has become most profound about the framing? The issue is becoming more and more framed in terms of equity and social justice. And it's possible now to refer to poor nutrition as an injustice, and to any effort to try to perhaps avoid tackling poor nutrition as actually a scandalous and unacceptable act. And that that injustice associated with poor nutrition denies individuals and societies of opportunities that are key to enabling them to have better lives. It would be just like insisting that a whole community of people halve their agricultural productivity or halve their cash income or attend half the school that others attend. If you insist that people have early lives that are poorly nourished, you are depriving them, you are committing an injustice. So therefore, we can't just look at nutrition as a life or death issue. It is an issue of social justice. It is an issue of equity. And as Sean said very clearly, it's an issue for outrage. Number two, and it's kind of linked, what does this mean for power, people in power, for people in government, for people with duties, for duty bearers as they're called in human rights language? And the answer is 
they really have to get themselves a bit more together. And what Ferro did in his presentation uh, as first discussion was show us just what is happening in the government of Ethiopia. And I've had the honor of working closely with him now for some years watching this happen. And you see, as well as trying now to get much better coverage and impact of the specific interventions, Faro and the people he's working with in Ethiopia are saying, we now need to ask questions about whether or not government policies, plans, and their execution are sensitive to the nutritional challenges that people face. Are women able to access the foods they need in local markets that are necessary for ensuring that their children have nutritious diets? Are the water and sanitation programs actually providing the kinds of water and sanitation that has meaning and relevance to women with small children who've got diarrhea for a third to half of the time and who find maintaining a hygienic environment incredibly difficult? Are the conditions under which women are having their children and then looking after them conducive to them being able to breastfeed? Asked in this way, the questions about the role of government and the role of people in power change a bit and become much more questions to do with whether or not power is being used properly, whether or not government is responding to the interests of the people in the face of this grotesque nutritional injustice that is occurring in our world today. And that's where all of us now, empowered with Lancet 2, need to be more energetic in talking to those with power about the kind of commitments that they as leaders are making to address nutritional injustices through direct interventions, through nutrition-sensitive government policies, and through an enabling environment that truly values the life and well-being and opportunity of small children and of women, whether they are rich or poor, equally. Thirdly, I do think we are reprofiling notions of capacity and notions of investment. I don't think we've got there yet, but I think Lancet 2 will help us. You need a different kind of person with different kinds of skills to actually participate in the interactions that occur in a national government or in a local government to do with ensuring access to nutrition-sensitive policies that bring benefits to people from, for example, a medical doctor like myself or from a traditional nutritionist who's schooled in the arts of dieting or from di dietary medicine or from a, an agric agricultural economist who's schooled in how you get the most out of every hectare of land or every uh, cubic 10 liters of water. This skill, the sets of skills that are needed to work in this way, again using some of the examples from the discussions, but particularly what Sandra said, People need to have a great mix of skills to operate in this area, and these are new kinds of skills. And they're not skills that necessarily are well taught at the moment. The capacity needs to be developed, and it needs cash, and it needs consistent cash. So this is a tricky area, but in perhaps that's a subject for the next Lancet series. Fourthly, processes and actors. Well, the real shift that I believe has taken place that was pointed out by several of the speakers in both in the papers and in the panel is that there is an intense civil society engagement at all levels in issues around nutritional justice globally right now. That's how stuff changes. That's how there's a shift when you get in really well articulated demands, sometimes uncomfortably articulated, put in the face of those with power to say, where is what you promised? Where is what you're supposed to deliver? Where is what the Lancet says people need? Why is it not there? What are you going to do about it? That capacity to engage civil society and to have different parts of civil society participating in accountability is key to continuing the shift from government being responsible for delivering things to people to government ensuring that people can access what they need for equity of opportunity and also for social justice. 
But it's not just civil society in terms of voluntary organisations. It's consumer groups, it's farmer organisations, and yes, it is enterprises. Enterprises are on the inside. If they're allowed to get away with not focusing on these issues of responsibility and on the issues, and sorry, and on the duties that come as a result of the power that they have, then they're being let off the hook. So there is no case at all for excluding businesses from the discourse on the enabling environment or on nutrition sensitivity, and increasingly they want to be, part, be there as part of their common business practice. And then other actors are also critically important to include inside the party. They are the research community. Science is part of the solution. They are also international organizations, foundations, and I believe that there will be more and more actors who should be part of this. And then the processes for engaging these actors are key, and those perhaps are what we are finding to be particularly challenging within the Sun movement, having established the kind of big tent that several people have referred to. How do you then create within that tent the systems through which different groups of actors can contribute to good results? And then lastly, fifth point, results and accountability been a big focus, and I think everybody has been very clear that it is vital that we continue collectively to focus on results and achieving result and, and accountability for those results. So there is an increasingly exciting process underway. It's not just in nutrition. I think Richard is right to be continuing to refer to the one of the other great areas of collective action on every woman, every child. It's the way in which health and development is going in so many fields that we're shifting away from sectors and disciplines to what some of us are referring to as the reality sector, what makes real sense to people, what they need to be able to have greater autonomy and better outcomes so that they become the center of attention and the rest of us have to organize ourselves so that we respond to their needs. Now, the concept of a scale-up nutrition movement came because our Secretary General said to several of us, that's Ban Ki-moon of the United Nations, I would like it to be possible that in the areas of food security and nutrition, that there can be better opportunities to bring together lots of different groups working together with trust, with shared results, and he, he continuously said, with mutual accountability. And it was his idea that we should put, with very great care, national governments or countries at the center of any new effort for nutrition and try to organize others around them in networks of support with a very broad and indeed quite soft system for trying to ensure that it's held together through a group of senior citizens from different stakeholder groups trying to ensure that the multiple efforts move in a concerted way. I think that to some extent that came from his experience of the Republic of Korea in the 1950s when it was an exceedingly poor country and seen by many to be a country with very little hope of emerging from extreme underdevelopment. Our own Secretary General himself often went for days with only one meal a day, and that itself not very nutritious. Had to walk two hours to school, often without shoes or shoes that were basically holes rather than shoes. And in his country, much of the recovery was due to the simultaneous engagement of lots of different stakeholders with an overarching framework, but lots of actors working together within that framework to try to transform the conditions under which people live with full ownership of the people and accountability to the people. Well, this movement has evolved, and I think that there are others like it, but all I would like to say as, as I close my remarks is that this movement is you, all of you. It's hundreds, perhaps thousands of other individuals and organizations all over the world. 
It's 40 countries that have committed to scaling up nutrition and have committed also to results. It's all of the United Nations system and the World Bank and many regional banks. It's many companies, lots of civil society, many of whom will be active, particularly tomorrow, in Hyde Park and other places. And most of all, it's the people for whom uh, this effort is, on whom it's focused. It's not owned or led by any individual. It's collectively led, it's collectively run, and it's my privilege to be part of it. And what we've seen in these four papers is going to contribute hugely to the effort of this movement and to those of us who work within the movement to try to make sure that over the next five years we will see sustained results. To Richard Horton, yeah, there, there were some challenges. I don't think that, uh, that, that that whole process worked quite as well as it did, but it stung me a lot into thinking about what we're all trying to do, and I think it was back to that time when I was working in WHO and had those discussions with you that I learned about your vision and then I watched it evolve, and I'd like just personally to pay a little tribute to you in front of everybody here. You're not just the editor of a prestigious medical journal. You're a kind of wizard who casts spells, and I think one of the spells you've passed has had a big influence on many of us who are part of this scale-up nutrition movement. We wouldn't be where we were if it hadn't been for you, for Bob, and all the many people who did Lancet One 2008. Thanks for the extra energy. Okay, let me, in, that's very, very sweet, David, actually, and thank very generous of you to say those words. But let me invite all of our um, speakers and panelists up to the front now because we have an opportunity for a little discussion. So can I invite David and Ferru and Andrew and Sandra and Anna to come and sit on these chairs? Look, before we start getting too complacent about ourselves, anybody here subscribe to a magazine called Red Pepper? Well, I do, and the article in the latest issue of Red Pepper isn't very kind to you or to I. Um, it is, so let me tell you, it is, it is um, a critique of the IF campaign, and the title of the article is Not Making a Movement. And what this article does is to dissect what we're all discussing today and saying we are covering up the truth of what's taking place in global nutrition. And here are the charges against us, that we have completely sidelined the Global South in our consultations and discussions around nutrition and scale-up of nutrition, number one. Number two, that we have created a collusive relationship with neoliberal governments. Number three, that non-governmental organizations that used to speak truth to power are more concerned at having a seat at the table of power and no longer speak truth to power, and we need to speak truth to them. And fourth, that there is a corporate takeover of agriculture in Africa that we are completely silent about. And finally, finally, and this is what War on Want has said about the IF campaign, that it's not challenging to power. What the IF campaign is about, they say, is that it is grounded in the is, is that it should be grounded in the principles of food sovereignty, and it's not, and that what this entire effort that we've been talking about today and tomorrow and at the weekend is about is um, it's being planned, and I quote, with the aid agencies to use the IF campaign to promote the Prime Minister, David Cameron, as a leader on the global stage. Now, I don't know whether any of those five charges against us are completely accurate, but let's be aware before we get too complacent, that there might be issues that we need to address which are uncomfortable and which might disrupt some of the equilibrium that we've been moving towards as the afternoon's discussion has been going on. I'd like to try and structure uh, the next 40 minutes or so um, in three ways, if I may. I'd like to try and focus on opportunities first, and then I'd like to focus on obstacles, and then 
conclude with actions. So in terms of opportunities, we've heard many opportunities mentioned um, over the course of uh, the day. Adolescence, integration, uh, M nutrition, somebody mentioned, the private sector, uh, alliances with other dimensions of global health, such as newborn movements and non-communicable diseases. So what I'd like to try and get a discussion going with the audience and the panel is, what are the best opportunities that we need to try and seize uh, in the coming years? So let's start up there, please. Uh, I think my question is mainly based on the presentation we heard from uh, Professor Andrew Doard. Now, let me explain very brief context why I'm asking this question. So I'm Kremlin Vikram, Dr. Kremlin Vikram Singer from Department of Public Health, University of Oxford. Uh, we all heard how useful the Lancet 28 nutrition series was. I completely agree, and it was very useful to frame my issue. Just give you one example how sometimes I have personally found it as an obstacle to create innovative programs in countries. So one example, we had a opportunity to create a program to look at how health in all policies or how different sectors can work together to achieve health outcomes. We selected nutrition because we thought that's a good sector to bring all the sectors together. And we thought the most difficult thing would be to get non-health people involved in this. So we went and asked agriculture people, rural development, home gardening, uh, microcredit programs, do you want to get involved in a nutrition promotion program? Surprisingly, they all said yes. When we went to the nutrition project, nutrition experts in a country, in local areas, they said, look, Lancet Nutrition Series has very clearly published what are the evidence, what are the actions which has evidence uh, which works. The things you are talking about, home gardening, microcredit programs has little evidence or lack of evidence. We only focus on the list that Lancet has provided. If you have money, invest it for fortification or supplementation, not on this. So, but we didn't have money for nutrition promotion. We had money for this multi-sectoral action. So my question is, we heard this issue that lack of evidence of impact is not evidence of lack of impact. But if you leave it for interpretation at that level, that will create a issue, the relationship issue with those local health experts. If I try to tell him that your interpretation is wrong, that's going to destroy my relationship and I, won't, I will not be able to work with them. So rather than leave it to interpret at that level, can Lancet be brave and move a little bit forward from the evidence? And publish a list that you believe, based on Professor Howard's model or other things, as recommended list of actions, and but giving the equal weightings. If you give second class treatment, saying these could be interesting or useful, they will drop it. And can Lancet okay. take that? Thank so you. That, we'll treat that as an opportunity, and we'll come back to that the moment. So, Francesco. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Francesco Branca from WHO. Uh, opportunities. I think we have three. And I'm really grateful for Lancet for having created some of these opportunities. So first opportunity is the alignment in, in the nutrition community. It has been created by this common vision about the problem, about the size of the problem. We have a common voice about the nutrition statistics, the numbers. That's the first thing. We have a common... Uh, view about where we have to go. We have uh, common targets which, which, have all, uh, we, which we all have recognized. I think we have a common understanding of the guidance that we have to do to uh, address the issue. And I'm very pleased to see that there's full alignment between uh, the scientific community uh, and, and the papers in the Lancet and what, for example, WHO is giving uh, to its member states. We had uh, uh, an assembly last year. Yesterday we uh, published uh, sort of a compendium of the WHO guidance. It's, we've been working together, of course, with, with all the uh, experts, and we are very pleased that there's uh, full consistency. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the second opportunity is really the fact that the, there is uh, an understanding now of the breadth uh, of the nutrition problems. And we're starting to uh, really establish the link with the non-communicable disease. And again, last week, the assembly uh, agreed on a, on a plan to address non-communicable diseases and, and, and diet and, and nutrition there is, is very prominent. Uh, I think paper one has put uh, overweight on the agenda of, uh, uh, of, of the nutrition community because you know, we really saw a divide between the NCD community and the nutrition community and that divide is starting to be uh, eliminated and I think also 
paper two is, is highlighting how we're perhaps having some problems in, in understanding what exactly needs to be done, but we're certainly moving in, in, the, uh, in the correct direction. Still, countries do not uh, address the double burden. That's, that's also something which, which has been found in a, a survey. Uh, and uh, particularly African countries, they, but the fact that we, we, we put that on the map will help uh, uh, filling that uh, gap. And the third opportunity is the fact that uh, we understand the importance of uh, uh, comprehensive guidance. That perhaps we have a clear guidance on direct nutrition interventions. Where does, uh, uh, where does the guidance on nutrition uh, um, on nutrition sensitive uh, uh, development come from, uh, we would need perhaps the UN General Assembly to address it in a, in a comprehensive way, just beyond the individual sectors. And I think the concept of looking at plausibility is going to be very important. The, uh, this is an approach which can be followed in a policy document where somehow we take uh, an approach which is based on a portfolio of actions. So some of them are best buys, things on which we can invest. Some of them will have to be uh, investment based on taking some risk that we don't have all the evidence there. Maybe we should use the uh, next year's uh, conference of nutrition to do that. Okay, very good. I think, Chancellor, you have your hand up next, and then I'll come. Lots of hands going up. We'll get that. Thank you. Jennifer Rigg, 1,000 Days. Um, I have a quick question to follow up on what many of you have mentioned in terms of the high-level panel report uh, as an opportunity, and Anna most recently as something to seize and really grab hold of. So we're lucky today to have in the room many people, I think, who can help with that. So what can we immediately do to take that opportunity to fill in the X, Y, and Z to also make sure that the ongoing political processes post HLP, indeed, um, many of which, of course, are very much underway now, um, have that common voice. A few short months ago, Lawrence and others spoke um, on this topic in Brussels, and we didn't know that we could even come to this point. So kudos. I think this is a, a real-time example of the opportunity we have for working together, but what's our next step um, or series of steps? And then um, in a similar vein, after a wildly successful Nutrition for Growth event this Saturday, thanks to uh, UK, Brazilian, and SIF leadership, um, what can we do in 2014, 2015, and 2016 and beyond? Um, we're talking a lot about the architecture piece but and mobilization, but I think we have a key opportunity um, immediately this week and beyond uh, to then uh, determine the next political thousand days uh, for results, but also for the, the groundswell that, that we're all aiming for. If we could p start to pin down some of those key points that will help us move forward, um, we will uh, be able to get to those results. Thank you. Um, I've been particularly impressed by the Ethiopia experience of, and to me having, I think, many in health and global health, we've toyed around with trying to get volunteers to do the grunt work of implementing programs, and Ethiopia has clearly taken the bull by the horns and put 30,000 community health volunteers on the state payroll. So I think this is this huge opportunity, and I would actually like to hear more about how did you generate the political will to do that? Um, I also wanted to address, we, we heard that, in fact, one of the key ingredients in HIV to get the mobilization was that communities affected by HIV actually had a voice, particularly in the developed world. Um, is there a potential opportunity with a growing concern about overweight and obesity in the developed worlds to get, to use that to also leverage more interest in nutrition globally? Uh, that uh, because, in fact, one of the huge challenges we faced, I think, in undernutrition is that, in fact, it's, it's usually invisible and in affecting people who, by definition, have no voice. And can we get, can we use that as an opportunity? That's a question I guess I would pose to all the panelists. Very good, yeah. And then we'll so just really quickly, um, I just want to acknowledge um, and thank Anna um, for that amazing recap. I, it was so on point in terms of the opportunities and challenges and, and really acknowledge all the work that you and 
all your colleagues have done. Uh, sorry to put, embarrass you um, on on getting and pulling together the uh, the nutrition for growth event. Um, I'm sure you have worked diligently behind the scenes, and we very much appreciate that. Um, your point about food systems um, is is absolutely spot on. I would love to see the Lancet, a, a medical journal, take on uh, this issue of food systems and how food systems are, are quite frankly um, ruining the health of, of millions of people because of these issues of, of obesity and undernutrition. Uh, so, and, and with that, the, the role of the private sector, I have to agree with your Red Pepper article about, you know, we've kind of been a little bit um, as a advocacy community, perhaps, or civil society, a little bit asleep at the wheel or turning perhaps a blind eye to, um, you know, this, this, the, the big ag investment in Africa. So. What I'd like to do um, in the last few minutes is then look at some of what you think are the most important obstacles that we have to address. The priorities that we really need to, the bottlenecks that we really need to prioritize if we're going to achieve the kinds of opportunities that we've outlined um, in the last half an hour or so. So let's just spend a moment talking about um, obstacles. So please. Uh, you, let me give you this strange thing, which doesn't amplify. But it does hmm. <laughs> um, Leslie Elder, World Bank. I think we still have not really figured out how to incentivize at almost any level, beginning, frankly, with the household and families. I think we have a real challenge because nutrition, malnutrition, is in fact hidden. Certainly stunting is for most families. So for me, one of the things that we all need to figure out as we go forward with the Lancet recommendations is how to incentivize at all levels seeking better nutrition for, for our children. The second thing is that I think semantics are important and I'd like to shout out to Sally. Um, at the bank, we're working very hard to break down the silos between ECD, nutrition, and other sectors. And so one thing that we've tried to do is actually call ourselves something different, because ECD is clearly seen as a preschool program, very often. So we're trying to talk about healthy growth and development for all children. What does that mean, and how do we get to it? So I don't know if that's the semantic answer, but I think we need to be clear about what we're talking about and to, be, to get outside our, our normal words. We need to be a little bit more creative. Third, I think it's um, critical to figure out how we really do the life course approach. That's so clear now from, this, the, from, the, new, from the new Lancet series. We, we say it all the time, but we don't really clearly understand how to integrate across the life series. In, in fact, especially, you brought up the issue around neonat neonatal specialists, neonatal programs don't deal with nutrition. And that's clearly where we have to be. And finally, metrics. That is a huge challenge for all of us, but especially at the bank. When we're working with our ag colleagues, for example, it is very difficult when we can't say to them, here are the two or three indicators that are going to help you demonstrate to all of us that you've ha achieved results for nutrition. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed. Go on the panel, and then I'll swing over here. Uh, thank you. Um, just a couple of points. On the issue of semantics and this um, I recently attended a conference called Healthy, uh, called Clean Fed and Nurtured, and I thought that this was a beautiful way to brand how we work together, and it's clean fed, all children should be clean fed and nurtured for a healthy start to life. So I just wanted to bring that up on semantics and joining up. It's not in my nature to talk about bottlenecks, I like to talk about solutions, so I should have probably commented on the first side and opportunities. Anyway, um, I think one of the really big challenges, well, for another thing is I'm an, a morning person, so the things that get said in the morning stick in my head, and the one thing that really stuck in my head from this morning is the fact, I think you, wizard, <laughs> said Monday it's nutrition, Tuesday Tuesday it's neonatal health and Thursday it's you know something else and this really the, to me this is a real bottleneck. The fact is that all of us have this enormous challenge, which is that we have to get to high levels of coverage and high levels of equity. And unless we figure out how to do this together, we're never going to get there. So I see this as you know a really critical thing that is I think fundamental to 
all of these issues. Um, I tend to think about the next five years or the next Lancet series, and we're in the preconception stage, and I now know we have to really be laying the seeds. So I'm really thinking about, you know, what, what do we need to be doing now to ensure that in a couple years down the road, we really have the evidence, the, the experience, the knowledge and, and brought together so that when we come to that next point, we're really prepared because this takes a long time. And um, <laughs> I feel like we might be work, we might be talking about the pre this week and the post this week. And I really hope that this week is an inflection point in, in this whole discussion and in this whole challenge. And one of the things that I want to just mention is this whole nature of accountability. And you said metrics. I mean, we are for the first time going to hold not just donors, but governments accountable for something. And we have to be able the metrics, the systems, the tools, the ability, and the foresight to figure out how we're going to actually monitor, track, and hold people accountable for this. And I think that's actually an enormous challenge and bottleneck, and I would love to hear some ideas okay. on how to solve it. Thank Facebook, you. I'm looking for people who haven't spoken yet as a priority, so please, I'll bear you. I don't think you've spoken yet. I'm Andrew from World Vision. Um, just to say thanks so much for this um, this series of papers. It's fantastic. Um, I'm a political scientist at heart, so I'm really pleased to see politics being mentioned um, and being looked at. And I think it's um, it's great that that's that's happening because politics is how this is going to change. And this is going to happen. Um, I think um, I would just like to also say thanks to um, Lawrence and the, um, the the issue around coordination between um, different sectors. And I think that's that's really critical. And if I'm allowed. From an NGO perspective, to speak truth to power, um, just to say, um, I think I think that in in places that are more fragile, in governments which are weaker and um, and don't have the. Uh, the, the, the strength um, to deal with these really complex issues. I think that donors and um, the international community, I include NGOs within that, um, damage and sometimes uh, weaken the ability of those governments to work together. Um, I'd just like to say, I'd just like to question and, and wonder how uh, this paper is going to change the way in which we work in those uh, difficult circumstances and difficult places and how we can better foster coordination between sectors in, in more fragile and conflict affected states. Thanks. Thank you very much. Now, who hasn't spoken? I'm going to give Stuart a chance because Stuart's been a silent partner, um, a little bit of a silent partner on the final paper. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> just want to flag the issue of capacity. It was it was mentioned obviously five years ago in the, in the last series, particularly strategic and operational capacity. Uh, clear, there are different capacities at different levels for different purposes. Uh, not a lot has changed in, in these last five years, and it still remains a major, major challenge. Um, actually, the, the issue of the case study of Maharashtra was mentioned. One of the big p steps forward they made was simply having Anganwadi workers in Anganwadi centers and ICDS centers. Uh, who were equipped, you know, had time, they had skills, they had refresher training, so it was a lot of the focus on the capacity issue. Um, and this is so important, obviously, in the, in the context of scale-up. I mean, if we're scaling up without underpinning it with the appropriate capacities. Um, David had mentioned capacity and cash. I don't know how much of the cash we'll, we'll be seeing, hopefully flowing, you know, from um, Saturday is going to be funneled into capacity strengthening, but we do need a major uh, investment over a 10 years plus cycle uh, in capacity. Okay, um, for anybody who hasn't spoken yet, I think you're, you're, I don't think you've spoken yet, so let's get a microphone to you. I think one of the bottlenecks we need to figure out too is the nutrition sensitive policies. Mm -hmm. I know we talk a lot about the lack of evidence and all that, but then Brazil held up as this great example. And from what I understand, basically Brazil achieved most of what they achieved through conditional cash transfer, the biggest program in the world. And sort of that, to me, speaks of you know, less evidence and what other evidence do we need sort of at scale. And I, I think we need to resolve this to get the money sort of to move forward with these programs. OK, so. very good. I'm going, to come, I'm going to come back to the panel, if I may now, because time is pressing and we do have to finish at 5. Um, to comment on, and we can turn obstacles around into solutions. We don't have to just say that paint it all very dark. Um, but let's, what do you think are some of the most, from what you've heard, most important obstacles that we can turn into solutions? So let me start from this end. Andrew. I'm not ready to speak. Oh, give me okay, give me a few minutes. Yeah, <laughs> 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 you, you can give us some. Um, <laughs> 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 wonderful, wonderful.
the I think one of the things we talk about is um, uh, multi-sectoral coordination, but I think what we also forget, as was mentioned, is looking inside, intra rather than inter. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think within the health system, as I said, there is uh, different programs running around, and at the end of the day, at community level, at delivery, there is one person doing it. So that's the person who's going to reduce neonatal diseases, child diseases, nutrition, everything. And in some areas, they are also responsible for agriculture. But using, I think, uh, if we think how we can uh, see inside and uh, use the, the opportunity or the platforms that, they, uh, uh, that are out there to uh, put in the, the different pro programs together, and it will be very easy to work with other sectors, I think. Okay. Uh, how do we turn an obstacle into a solution? What would you say, something? More money, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's very good. Well, there we go, Anna. That's, that's, that's your cue. That's your cue. <laughs> Sorry, I definitely think it's more money. It's how we use that money, uh, where it's going, what it's going for, tracking it, uh, and making sure we're accountable of how we spend that money. And on top of that, aligning that money, or how we spend it, to what the national government needs to spend it on and based on the evidence within that context that they're operating in. Uh, but definitely, yes, more money, please, Anna. Thank you. <laughs> sure, no problem. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so I wanted to pick up on, on Stuart's point um, about capacity. And um, I think you're absolutely right. And I just I think we're a bit short of kind of a clear vision for how to do this, I, I, it feels to me. like. This is clearly, there's a lot of, you know, because the, the problem is complex and multi-layered. And I think, um, you know, there are lots of um, sort of islands of excellence where this has been done well. But I think we're not able yet to say, okay, how do we make this really add up to a significant kind of step change in the levels of capacity across the board from the leadership down to the delivery. And uh, I think you know, we, we should really try and sort of collectively take a strategic look at this and how we, how we, do, how we try and solve it. Because um, everyone's talking about it, but it's not, we don't really, I don't feel yet, have a coherent sense of how to get there. Um, yeah. Okay, David. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I actually think in the end that probably the biggest obstacle to moving forward in this work uh, is ourselves, me uh, included, and that is actually because of how uh, we tend to operate, whether we are individuals, working in institutions, participating in government, working in an enterprise, or working in an organization. Because by and large, we find it most satisfactory to identify the universe in which we operate and then to use the term we and it was a colleague user who asked who are we which I thought was a very important comment today we use that notion of kinship and of comfort uh, to define how we're going to think and act and I think uh, personally that this particular subject of uh, good nutrition, but like an awful lot of other aspects of, of human well-being and potential, just simply requires us always to be asking ourselves, who am I working for? What are my responsibilities? And how am I judged? And so it's those questions of uh, the constituency responsibility and accountability that in the end becomes central. And I do think that there is change. I don't think it's easy change. I think there are periods which are intensely uncomfortable. And I think the way in which a whole group of stakeholders have come together to focus on the events, uh, the if and other events all over the world that are happening tomorrow, and then the events happening on Saturday is a r remarkable change, the way it's been done. And I think the fact that you're all here today is also good. You see, this series wasn't going to be launched today, was it, Bob? You thought you had a little bit more time. Yes. 
but you yourself looked at your own responsibilities and you realized that this event was coming up on Saturday and you said, I'll move it earlier. And you managed to persuade people who have got masses of responsibilities of their own to somehow come together with you. And you brought it now so that it was possible to create a linkage. And I just think, as I watch that kind of thing happening, I know it's done at massive personal cost for a lot of the people who do it all over the world, everywhere. But as I see that shift happening, that people are really thinking differently, establishing different responsibilities, accountabilities, and constituencies, then I feel incredibly inspired because perhaps there will be, as a result of all this, in five years' time, some very, very big shifts. Okay, very briefly now, I've got one to have one comment from each of our panel about what they hope will be different in the future compared with the past after not just this series but after what's taken place <laughs> at the weekend. So we are going to start with you, Andrew. You can't put it off to somebody else now. So what, what <laughs> would you like to see different? Well, I would like to see us all working together. And that's not just across cultures, it's also across levels. I, I think David has been very inspiring. Very good. Very well. Inspiring. You've been inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> One thing you'd like to see different uh, after the component before. I think I'd uh, like to see a 40% reduction as it's uh, estimated uh, even earlier than five years. Very good. Very good. <laughs> That's so, what I was going to say. You can second it. Yeah, I second that. <laughs> Triple it, in fact. Uh, Anna, one thing different after the weekend compared with before. Um, I I hope that we've got a. Um, I think we're, what we've where we've got to see so far is we've got a lot more political men momentum. But I'm I'm hoping that after Saturday we've got. Uh, that's reached a kind of a much higher level with a much bigger set of global leaders who are tackling this problem and are really serious about changing it. Um, uh, and, yeah, the, lots of things are in place to achieve that, so let's hope we get there. And David, your last word? In about 1975, I think, Richard, um, there was an extraordinary event in Alma Ata mm -hmm. in Kazakhstan, the International Conference on Primary Health Care. And uh, I was sort of quite a neophyte then in international health. <coughs> but it was a really extraordinary moment in which the concept of what a health system is about and what health is about started to change and it hasn't stopped changing since. And those of us now don't always remember what it was like before that time. Let's hope that over the next few years, let's not have it very long, that the concept of nutrition for all becomes ingrained into all policies everywhere. Thank you very much indeed for the time.